again, Hosea, Hosea 8 and 9, I've titled the message simply, Reaping What You Sow. I think all of us have reaped to our flesh and then suffered the consequences of that. And we can reap to the Spirit and, and benefit from the Spirit. But remember, it's a choice. You need to choose this moment, this day, how you're going to live your life. And it's something you're going to do each and every day, and sometimes several times a day. Because it's so easy to get off track. It's so easy to be distracted. It's so easy to be tempted and drawn away. Our spirit may be willing, but our flesh is weak. And tonight we're going to be looking at really at the, the Lord's pronouncement of the coming judgment upon Israel. And when I'm talking about Israel, I'm talking about the ten northern kingdom. It's also called Ephraim at the time, or Samaria, which was the, really the, the capital at that time. We're going to see again that there's always a warning before wrath. Have you ever noticed that in your own life? God will warn you before you walk into sin. You'll either ignore what he says, you'll suppress that, and do what's right in your own eyes like they did in the book of Judges, or you will yield to God. And whatever you sow, you will suffer consequences. And this is why this book is so important, again, because we've been looking again at the spiritual adultery and idolatry and various other things of, of Israel. Israel had missed the mark, just as every one of us have missed that mark. In fact, let me read and begin with Hosea chapter 10, verse 13. That should go on the screen you see there. You have plowed wickedness, and you have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies, because you have trusted in your own way and in your own numerous warriors. The scripture is clear, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Have you ever found yourself trusting in your own self, your own abilities, your own gifts? And unless we check ourselves right away, we, we fall back into that rut. We do the same things that Israel did and later on Judah did. And we really can't point the finger at Judah. We can't point the, the finger at Israel because we would have done the same thing, just like Adam and Eve in the garden. We all have that bent towards sin. We need to, to be prepared now and recognize that weakness. In a sense, have a, a fire drill. When this happens, when that temptation comes, I'm going to avoid that. I'm going to run. At, at whatever it costs, I'm going to trust in the Lord and lean not on my own understanding because here's the consequences. Again, it says you have plowed wickedness and you've reaped injustice. It will come back. What you sow, you will reap. And then Proverbs one thirty one it says this, So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way. And this is so important. They eat of the, the fruit of their own way. They're of their own devices. They're going to suffer. And I imagine that's been true of you in your life as it's been in my life in what I call those B.C. days before Christ. Because that's natural to sin, blinded by the God of this world. But when you become a believer now, you have a choice. You no longer have to sin. You no longer have to be angry. You no longer have to walk in unforgiveness or bitterness. But when we do, we choose. Like a dog returning to its vomit. And sometimes the people think, well, God's not going to know. No one knows. God knows. He knows all things. In fact, in Galatians 6, 7, notice what it says. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he shall also reap. What are the benefits you want in your life? And I'm not talking about great money. Do you, do you want to hear those words, good and faithful servant? Do you want to go to heaven? You want to walk in righteousness and walk in the light as he does? It's a choice that you make. 
Don't turn around and start judging everyone else because when you judge everyone else, the odds are you'll probably be doing the same thing. You begin condemning others and you will be condemned. How you judge others, others will judge you and you'll find that you'll go back into this rut. Now, part of Adam's curse was the ground, if you remember, that would bring forth the thorns and thistles in response to his work and by the sweat of your brow you will eat your own food. The curse. When we reap of the flesh, we suffer of that curse. Don't you think Adam really understood this idea of you reap what you sow? Literally? Not only literally, but figuratively? Spiritually? He spiritually died and separated from God that day. He understood that more than most people. He suffered the consequences of the flesh. And then back to Galatians 6, 8. Notice what it says again. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. The Bible is always telling us this is the way you walk. It's a straight and narrow path that leads to life. Which path will you choose? The straight and narrow that leads to life or broad and wide that leads to destruction? Sometimes we choose that path that's broad and wide thinking that we're going to get back on that path, but the the longer you're on that path, the longer you're away from the Lord, it's, it's harder and harder to come back. Yeah, the traffic's too much, eh? Yeah. Well, let's begin in chapter 8 and there's seven punishments that are described. And this is the very nature. God is holy and God must judge sin. The warning from cover to cover. Joshua would say, choose whom you'll serve this day. For me and my family, we're, we're going to serve the Lord. It's a choice that you make. Notice in verse 1, though, we see that first punishment. Put the trumpet to your lips. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and they've rebelled against my law. Now it begins with that, set the trumpet to the mouth. This You'll find it in Joel in many places. It's the warning. It's a battle coming on. We're going to see that really this, this one that's like an eagle, that whenever you hear that word like, it's a comparison. Swoop down very quickly. That's what Assyria did. And, and carried again the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes away. They took large fish hooks and they put them through their lips. And they put them in long lines and pulled them back to Syria. They were some of the, the most wicked and vicious people at that time. To put a trumpet to your lips. There's a warning. Sometimes if the warning is too late because the people have come to that point of no return, but it's least to get them to reflect. If you hear the trumpet, maybe there'll be a time to repent. Not with the rapture, though, because when we hear that trumpet and, and the twinkly eye will be caught up, it's too late. So this trumpet is, is really like a ram's horn in this sense. And again, the eagle refers to the Syrian army. And God will use someone more wicked, and he always does this, someone more wicked, more evil, to judge his own people. In fact, he raised the Syrians up for that very purpose. He's the author of history when you stop and think about it. Now, it also talks about there, again, the... It'll come against the house of the Lord. You're going you're gonna to find different teachers will say different things, and I'm going to kind of give you some thoughts to think about and something you have to work out in your heart. But when you talk about the house of the Lord, certainly we can talk about the temple, but when you talk about the house of the Lord, the temple, certainly all the temple, all the, the things of worship were carried away. But the house of the Lord is really the people. The land, the people, as well as the temple was destroyed. And it certainly is not talking about the temple in Jerusalem, but it was the tabernacle. And remember in the northern, ten northern tribes, you had, again, you had Dan at the top. 
Bethel at the bottom where they worship with the golden calves. And that was so they wouldn't go and worship when the, the kingdom was divided back to Jerusalem. And we'll follow that as we go through. Notice the two reasons the Bible says there, two reasons God allowed. And remember, God allows. God's allowing the things that are happening in this country and other countries, the, the economy and everything. It's to, to bring us to our senses, to repent, those that need to repent, for others to suffer. But just like you see the judgments in the book of Revelation, it's, it was always in the sense, it, the Bible would say, and they would not repent, and they would not repent. So God, God's giving ample time for the, the people to repent, but they won't repent, and that's when the judgment must fall. God is patient and long-suffering. But we're not so patient, are we, with others, with each other? When somebody stops quickly on the, the road in front of you and you almost run into them. You know, but see, God wants to force this patience in us. How do you become patient? You're in impatient situations. So there's two things he says there. Notice they transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. A covenant is something that, again, it's so important to understand, but people today don't understand a covenant. When you get married, you're in a, a covenant relationship. That covenant relationship is between God and a man and a woman. There's a covenant that's between two people. It's kind of like a contract in a sense. It's a promise to do these things. But when you see Abraham, again, in a covenant with God, and, and that when they would do a covenant, oftentimes it would be on a slight sloping hill, and they would cut a groove in the hill, and they would slay animals, cut them in half, and the blood would run in, and they would walk barefoot through the blood, and whoever didn't keep that covenant, the blood would be up on their head. The covenant is very important to understand. Can you imagine if a husband and wife had to walk through that and the blood is upon their head if they didn't keep that contract? We have the example to know how important it is to God, but, but we don't take the importance that God does. We, the things that are important to God should be important to us. The things that God hates, we should hate. God hates sin because it destroys people. I've had people say, God doesn't hate anything. God is love. Yes, God loves, but he hates sin that destroys his people. And we should hate sin. So they transgressed the covenant. They had no regard for the covenant. They, they broke his law. They gave no regard for it. And it's important to understand God had promised to bless them if they, they kept this covenant and they are suffering the consequences of the choices. Through the centuries, the people had broken the covenant time and time again. Isn't that the way it works in your life, in my life, before we became believers? We, we just continually sinned, and, and, and oftentimes it got worse and worse and worse and worse. It became easier and easier to lie or steal or whatever it is because their consciences were seared. And this is what had happened to Israel. They, their consciences were seared. And they began to suppress the truth. You can read Romans 1. We'll read a little bit of that a little later. But again, they had hardened their hearts. They had come to the point of no return. God had to judge them. God's holy. He had to judge them. And you'll hear people today says, God's not going to judge anyone. God will judge. He will judge you and me, perhaps rewards. But our judgment as far as our sin is up on the cross. The same way that you and I saved was the same way that Abraham was saved. Moses was saved. And even in Israel, those ten northern tribes, God had a remnant that were faithful. And if you pray, and I pray, God, make us faithful to you in every way. Make our hands faithful. Make our minds faithful. 
God will do that in your life. We need to recognize the consequences of reaping to the flesh, reaping sin, and God must judge it. Well, this idea of covenant is a major theme in the Old Testament. It's a major theme in the New Testament because you and I are, again, grafted in and and we come into this new covenant and this new covenant is also sealed with the blood of the lamb upon the cross. Let me read for a moment Genesis 15 verse 8 through 11 and he said, oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess this? And God's giving him this promise so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And then he brought all these to him and they cut them in two and laid them each in half opposite each other. But he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses of Abraham or Abram drove them away. And this is what I'm talking about. The animals they cut and the blood ran in. Abraham was so stressed over the the consequences of breaking that covenant because he knew he can't keep it. Just as you and I cannot live a perfect life. Yet there are those today in the body of Christ that say, yeah, we can reach sinless perfection. Show me the, the person that has. It's that grace that we need. His grace is enough for those that believe and trust and rest in in him. Judgment must come. The second punishment we see is in verse 2. And and the the focus is that the people had made a a false profession. Notice with me in verse 2, they cry out to me, my God, we of Israel know you. But as we follow through, it's obvious they didn't know them. Now remember how I talk. I believe there's only a small remnant within the body of Christ, universal, that is really saved. Maybe only 25%. A remnant. The Bible always talks about a remnant. Remnants. Those that are remnant possess a relationship with God. They hear his voice. They're obedient to him. They follow him. But many profess they know him, but they don't keep his commandments. They've never been born again. And here what we have is there are many who profess. They cry out, oh God, oh Abba. They go through all the religious moves, but they don't know the power of God and the salvation. The same problem that was in the Old Testament is the same problem in the church today. Why is this so important today? Because hopefully it's a wake-up call for some, some that might be listening online. God will judge. God knows the heart. See, these people here he's talking about pretended to believe in the Lord and, and his holy word. Their profession was just hypocritical service seems similar to what I talked about in another way on Sunday. It's just their religion was skin deep. That's it. Their hearts were set on pursuing their lust, their pleasures, their possessions of this world. All sin is traced back to three areas. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of the life. You find that in 1 John chapter 2. It's in Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess to know God, but their deeds, they deny him. Being detestable, disobedient, worthless for any good deed. Now, it's important to understand, you may be one of those people that he's talking about, or you may know people like that. Please don't condemn them if you know someone like that. Please pray for them. Priests come alongside them, encourage them. Open up the Bible with them. But recognize there will be some that that will just deceive themselves, and the Bible talks about that again and again and again. Please, don't deceive yourself. 
Examine yourself and see if you're of the faith. And why I share these words, these are words that we share with one another. Our actions, do they line up with the word of God? You have people within the body of Christ, and, and we'll talk about it later on, but they're gossips. And yet those are one of the sins that God says they will not inherit the kingdom of God when you slander people. And they're saving themselves. So when we see these things, and gosh, if it's something that I might be, Lord, is this true in my life? We need to get down on our knees and we need to cry out to God, God, is this true in my life? What is it that I need to change in my life? Well, in verse 3, we see the third punishment that people had rejected. What was good? In verse 3, Israel had rejected the good. And the enemy will pursue them because they rejected what was good and right. God had raised up the Syrians, swooped down like an eagle. This country will at some point become a third world country or something will happen because it's not in prophecy in the end times. No matter how many times people try to find the United States in there, everything focuses around Israel. And we know the whole world is going to turn against Israel. And we're not in the question. Good means truly seeking, believing in the Lord. Seeking after his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God is righteous. And he'll add all things. He'll take care of it. But they were seeking the world. They were seeking other countries to, to arm them, to protect them. They weren't seeking God. It would be as, as if you or I, we talk about prayer, but we never pray. And we, we try to take things in our own hands or, or try and get other people to help us. Now, there's nothing wrong with having doctors and nurses and hospitals and, and police. Those things, are they're good. There's nothing wrong with having an army, but if you're depending on the army instead of God. Any country that depends upon God, that gets down on their knees, is obedient to God, God will watch over, he will keep them. See, so good truly means seeking and believing the Lord, the, the only and true living God. See, there are many people who believe in Jesus, but he's not the Jesus of the Bible. Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, and, and through chapter 6, verse 1 says this, I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me and come and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. See, until they acknowledge their guilt, that's what God wants is for you to acknowledge your sin. And, and when we acknowledge your sin, it's, Lord, forgive me for all my sin today. We need to confess our, our bitterness, our anger, our unforgiveness. Our hypocrisy. Now there's nothing wrong with a blanket, but, but God wants us to be very specific. And what's important about being specific is, that, is the fact that I need to be aware that this is my weak point. This is what I have to avoid. And when you confess your sin, half the battle is over. The enemy can't control you at that point. When you, you confess your sin, whether you starting with God, and, and sometimes confess it to a brother, to a sister. The devil cannot control you. You know that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Look with me in Amos chapter 5, verse 4. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live. A Jewish man I knew, he says, it never tells us to seek the Lord. Just do a search on seek in the Bible and see how many times it comes up. Seek me, you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Habakkuk 2.4 says, behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. 
but the righteous will live by faith. What prevents a person from acknowledging their sin or even coming to God is, is a proud heart. Every one of us here struggle with pride. And we need to confess it and repent of it. And recognize apart from him we can do nothing, nothing at all. Nothing of value. Doing deeds of righteousness in the spirit of justice and mercy and humility, that's what God requires. In fact, listen as I read Micah 6 a. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice? Notice to love kindness. And walk humbly with your God. See, you, you cannot be proud and arrogant and walk humbly with your God. If you're pointing out to others the sin in everyone else's life, you are proud and arrogant. In the end, God will humble you. God will break you. It's that arrogant, proud heart that separates you from God. Amos 5, verse 14 and 15, Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gates, and perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Hear that word again, remnant. There's always a remnant. Are you the remnant of God? Ask God, are you, are you part of that remnant? Have you given him your heart? Or are you living a hypocritical life? And I believe, as you've heard me say before, there's a little hypocrisy in all of us, and God's purging that from us. A little by little, he's removing that from us. Like peeling a, a layer of an onion off, one layer at a time. And gosh, I, I, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that thinking, or I said that, or it came across that way. Yeah, it, it's not right. And that's when we have to go and confess that. Well, look with me, the fourth punishment, the people had really chosen leaders. This is important. Listen to this. They've chosen leaders without seeking God's guidance, God's will, or God's consent. Verse 4, they have set up kings, but not by me. They have appointed princes, but I did not know it. And with their silver and gold, they have made idols for themselves that they might be cut off. There are those churches today that pick the leaders. An elder, a deacon, a pastor. They're called by God. How do you know an elder? We were talking about it Wednesday. They're eldering. A deacon is deaconing. A pastor, you know, he has that shepherd's heart. A, a teacher is, is teaching and people are listening. And all we are to do is acknowledge God reveals who he chooses. But they were choosing people that would do the things they want, would grant them favor, just like we have in politics and I think in almost every country in the world today. Who's popular? Who's popular with you? Is it God or man? They had chosen leaders on the basis of their charisma, their political promises, their, their agendas, their scheming, their power, their wealth, but not on the basis of righteousness or strong character or ability. The Lord's evaluation of leadership is not a single ruler had ever been good. You know, in their way, there was not one single leader that was really following in the right track. In fact, in their brief history, lasted only 210 years. Plagued with lawlessness, immorality, and violence. Nine different dynasties. Ruled in a short period of time and 1.5 different kings in a period of 13 years. See what happens when you, when you make your decisions apart from God? We seek him. We seek his will. 
We want to see what God wants to do. We want to follow him and not run ahead of him. Look with me again in verse 5 and 6. We're going to see really the fifth punishment. The people use their own imaginations to, to create idols for themselves. I imagine at some point every one of us here had idols in our house. People look at me funny when I say that. You, you, you make an idol. Sometimes it's a car. Sometimes it's a person. Sometimes it's a hobby. It could be sports. Well, gosh, the big football game's on. That's more important than coming to meet with God. And the list goes on of things. What is important to you? Is he priority of your life? And certainly it wasn't true of them. Verse 5 goes on and says, And as he, re- he had rejected your calf, O oh, Samaria, saying, My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? For from Israel, even this, the craftsmen made it, so it is not God. And surely the calf of Samaria will be broken to pieces. See, it was in Bethel and it was in Dan, the two points in, in Israel, that they would set up these golden calves and they go and worship. And from there, that leading them in the sin, this was the leadership, came from the top. It sprung up everywhere. A little sin. Will leaven the whole lump. Exodus 20, verse 3 through 6 says this You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth or beneath the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me, and notice, keep my commandments. They weren't to make idols. They did everything but. They had their own form of religion. It was outward. It was hypocritical with the Lord. They worshiped. The Lord had already warned them before they come into the promised land, if you don't destroy the people, the animals and the children, you will find yourself doing the same thing as they did. In the end, they were sacrificing their own babies for prosperity, for comfort. Isn't that what we do when we do abortion in many kinds? For our comfort, I can't afford, and the list goes on. These would be the the people had given their loyalty to the calf idols that Jeroboam had set up. Remember, Samaria was the capital of that northern kingdom. And it represented the the whole nation. And let me read from 1 Kings 12, 28 through 30. So the king consulted, made two golden calves, and he said to them, It's too much for you to go to Jerusalem and behold your gods, O Israel, brought you up from the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel, the other in Dan. And now the thing is, now this thing became a sin and the people went to worship before them, one as far as Dan. If you go to Israel, you can see this site in Bethel. It's in the West Bank and Dan and in the north, just above the Sea of Galilee. You can see where the altar was and where they did it. You can see it's on a high place because it's on a hill. And you can see all the way over to Syria. You see all the way over to Lebanon. And they would go up to these high places. What we're seeing here is God's anger burns against all wickedness. Especially against the idolatry, false worship. He rejects and judges all the idolaters. He alone is the true and living God, the only God. Deuteronomy 6, 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. See, this is something that they would say, say the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be upon your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons and you shall talk to them when they sit in the house 
and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hands and on the frontals of your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorpost of the house and on the gates. And there are churches that have these signs marked in the front yard, and they miss the spiritual application. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And whatever your eyes see, it should be seen him, his word. When we trust in our own mind and create gods for us to worship, so-called gods, it's nothing more than a, a figment of our imagination. Perhaps you remember something of a child that happened to you. And I know in, in many cases those things that people say, oh, this happened to me and this happened to me. But sometimes they're a figment of our imagination, their dream. Not all, but many are. I remember talking to my mom and my mom says, no, that's not the way it was. And that she would explain it. We have to be very careful what comes in this mind and what we do. We have to let go of the past and we have to move on. Because if we're hanging on the past, then, then we're never really moving forward. We're never pressing into him and pressing on. It, it's, it's only a bunch of moves and oftentimes hypocrisy. Jeremiah 10.10 says this, For the Lord is the true God. He's the living God, the everlasting God. At his wrath the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure the indignation. Naaman 1.6 says, Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure his burning anger? His wrath is poured out like a fire and the rocks are broken up by him. And I don't want to be here when the judgment comes. I'm so thankful that the church will not go through the tribulation. The tribulation is for, for Israel who is, is rejected. It's a time of testing. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. And we'll talk more about that in one of the other books as we come. In verse 7 it goes on. For they sow to the wind. They reap the whirlwind, the standing grain. And there's no heads and it yields no grain. Should it yield and strangers would swallow it up. See, there's two reasons he gives here for God was going to bring this awful judgment upon them. First, the people were guilty of sowing the wind. It, it, it means they were sowing nothing. Nothing for the future. What are you sowing for, again, heaven, eternity? Now, I know some churches use that. Well, you've got to send more money in here, sow for heaven. I believe that's part of it. But really, the real thing is, how are you living your life spiritually? Are you telling people about Jesus? How are you living your life? Are you living it in mercy and grace and love and obedience with him? So he's saying, really, you're sowing to the wind. The same thing as sowing absolutely nothing. You're, you're depending on harvest, but you haven't done anything. And he's talking about his relationship because they're sowing to the flesh. They're sowing to something else. Their choices were bringing destruction upon them. Year after year, the people of the northern kingdom had, had not planted seeds of righteousness or obedience. No, they were following after, pursuing after other gods which were not gods at all. The people's idolatry was a wind that would reap, would reap a whirlwind and utter destruction. Second, the people were being swallowed up by the wicked nations they were associated. That's in verse 7. See, the eyes of God had become just like, uh, again, just like the pagan nations around them. See, in God's eyes, this is what had happened. They just became just like doing the same things. They looked to them to help them, to reach out, to protect them. But they were practicing idolatry, adultery. Worshipping false gods, sacrificing their own children, stealing, murdering, raping. And these were supposed to be God's people, God's children. Verse 8, look with me, Israel is swallowed up. They're now among the nations like a vessel which no one delights. There's a vessel, the Bible talks about a vessel of dishonor. 
It's worthless. It's ripe for destruction is another way of putting it. Look with me in verse 9. For they have gone up to Syria like a wild donkey all alone. And Ephraim has hired lovers. And even though they hire allies among the nations, now I will gather them up and they will begin to dimish because the burden of the kings or the king and princess. Notice the reaction of God against Israel was strong. God's not a weak God. He's been patient. He's been long-suffering. But there's a point that you try God. And God says enough is enough. And judgment will fall. For generations, God had been patient with the people. But there came a point when he could no longer tolerate their wickedness, their evil practices, their distrust in him. Now, he was going to gather them up for judgment, allow them to just, in a sense, waste away. And let Assyria do everything they want. Now, there was a remnant that would go. They would suffer the consequences of, of the nation of Israel, but God would still protect them. And God would bring them back. And God would hear their prayers. Look with me in verse 11. Since Ephraim is, has multiplied altars of sin, they have become altars of sinning for him. Though I wrote for him 10,000 precepts of the law, they regarded it as a strange thing. You can just see the attitude they have to God. And yet they were going through the moves of worship while worshiping another God. Verse 13, as for my sacrificial gifts, they sacrifice the flesh and they eat it, but the Lord has taken no delight in them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish them for their sins and they will return to Egypt. Now, they'll go to Egypt and they'll look for help. But again, that picture also gives us a spiritual picture. They, they return to the world, the world's way. Egypt's a picture of the world. The consequences are, is, is Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, The wages of sin is, is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, all they would have to do is turn to the Lord. All they would have to do is confess and repent but their pride would get in the way and then in Galatians chapter 6 we've already mentioned this 7 through 9 that's Galatians 6 7 through 9 do not be deceived God is not mocked whatever a man sows this he will also reap for the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption the one who sows the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Have you ever just got tired of just doing what's right? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, you guys have got it together. You know, the thing is that sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I look around and I have to confess, Lord, forgive me for the things that's going in, because you can buy into the devil's lies for a moment. See, don't deceive yourself. We're all capable of that. There's this idea that, that everyone that I've ever met that's been honest with me says, you know, I've questioned whether I'm really a believer or not. And they give the enemy a foothold. And you have to recognize that there's this spiritual battle going on, and we have to take every thought captive but in again in verse 9 he says that let us not lose heart in doing good we need to keep our focus it needs to be preeminent upon Jesus Christ and we need to do good whether we see the fruit of it or not we need to go out and share the gospel whether we see fruit or not because God's called us but we can see it in our minds spiritually we can see the harvest because we know God's word does not come back void it's in Proverbs 22, 8. He says, he who sows iniquity will reap vanity, and the rod of his fury will perish. In Job 4, 8, according to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. 
See, you, you find it from cover to cover of this thing, and, and we don't acknowledge it, do we? Because if we don't read it, we don't know it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. We need to get in the word, and we need to, to study the word. In 1 Peter 3.18, notice what it says. For Christ also died for the sins once for all. Notice the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Right from the very beginning, God had a plan to redeem sinful man. Even before Christ come, all they would have to do is believe in God. There was that promise of the Messiah way back. They knew that. And the promise that they believed it would be, would be seen in the way they lived their life and the choices they make. Look with me in verse 14. And For Israel had forgotten his maker and built palaces in Judah, multiply fortified cities. And I will send a fire upon the cities that they may be consumed all their dwellings. See, but instead of trusting in the Lord, the God of the, the universe, the people both in, in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, they chose to, to trust in the works of man. Isn't that what, what false religion teaches? You can be saved by good works. Man can be good enough. Let me encourage you, you can't be good enough. But by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting in him, you can be saved. So they built these palaces, housing, strong cities, walls. They had a great economy and wealth going for them and prosperity at this time. Um, again, employment was great, you might say. Public works and all the things built monuments to themselves. When I went back to California last time I'm going down the freeways and the freeways were nicer in some areas than the neighborhoods I went through because the freeways had all this fancy concrete work and artwork and I'm not talking about graffiti but designs and everything and, and trying to magnify the cities as wonderful cities but the crime levels were just as bad if not worse. See what a great community we are private businesses farming commercial trade all these things they were good and it all crumbled before them all because they forgot the lord and they trust in human ability Matthew 25, verse 31 through 33 says this but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him he will sit in his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And then in Matthew 25, verse 41, and he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which he's prepared for the devil and the angel. See, the judgment is coming and there's no way person rejects Jesus Christ, rejects God, will ever get to heaven. And people say, well, I don't know. I, I really believe this is going to happen. God's God's a God of love. He's not going to judge anyone. In fact, there's many ways. I don't have to go and believe what you believe. God is warned from cover to cover what lays in the future. Romans chapter 1 says, every man, every woman is without excuse. God's made it evident in his heart. There is a God. We've all been given moral consciences. And we'll either acknowledge it or we'll suppress that truth. We'll either choose to do what's right in our own eyes or we will submit to God. Look with me in verse 1. Do not Rejoice, this is chapter 9 of Hosea, we're continuing. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with exultation like the nations. For you have played the harlot, forsaking your God. You have loved harlot's earnings and every threshing floor, and threshing floor and wine press will not feed them, and the new wine will fail them. Here's the spiritual picture. 
You know, here's the literal and here's the spiritual picture. They knew exactly what God was saying, but they would take the prophets, they would persecute the prophets, torment them, treat them as outcast. They would find prophets to tell them what they wanted to hear, just as the New Testament talks about people will find, again, teachers for their itching ears. Sadly, they were attributing their harvest, their property, all the things that were good, what appeared to be good, to the false gods, not to the Lord. And they were simply unfaithful to God himself. And they were turning away from him, turning to these so-called gods and exalting man and putting him up on a pedestal. Now look with me in verse 3, chapter 9, verse 3. We see the sixth punishment. It's a casting away. It's a, a picture of separation really from God. That, that alone has got to be hell. Being separated from God for all eternity, knowing that God has offered you eternal life, abundant life with him. Verse 3 goes on this way. And they will not remain in the Lord's land, but Ephraim will return to Egypt and Assyria they will eat unclean food. They will not pour out drink and offerings of wine to the Lord. Their sacrifices will not please them. Their bread will be like mourner's bread. And all who eat it will be defiled. For the bread will be themselves alone. It will not enter the house of the Lord. What will you do on that day of appointed feast and all the day of the feast of the Lord? Now remember the feast was the feast was the feast unto the Lord. When you come to the Gospel of John, it says the Feast of the Jews. Written not to Gentiles necessarily, but it, the feast became their feast. As if this church was our church. Whose church is this? Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. What is the church? It's not the building, it's the people. And whatever building and wherever we're at, we gather, we are the house of God. We are, again, the bride of Christ. But the feasts they had defiled. Verse 6, for behold, they will go because they will go because of destruction, and Egypt will gather them up, and Memphis will bury them, and weeds will take over their treasures of silver, and thorns will be in their tents. It's without hesitation the Lord here pronounces this the judgment. The Lord is now cut to the chase. He's been patient, as I mentioned, he's been long suffering, but there's a point. They're without excuse. He's revealed himself time and time again, but they've ignored. For me, I didn't get saved till I was roughly 46 years old. How many times had I ignored God speaking to me? I'm so thankful the Lord was patient and long-suffering with me. But some will go a whole lifetime and never really acknowledge God the God of all creation. So what are these things? He pronounces five-fold punishment and banishing the people. The first point I want to call to you is in verse 2. The people no longer enjoy the, the fruitful land promised by God. God, God had promised that land. That, that's the problem in, in Israel today, the West Bank. God has promised that land. God separated them, taken them away from it because of their disobedience. Verse 2, that's what it's talking about. And then the people would be banished from God's land in the promise of it. That's verse 3. It just follows as we read. And the people no longer would have the opportunity to worship the Lord in the, in the promised land of four. They, they couldn't worship there anymore because they've been separated. And then in verse 5, the people were unable to celebrate the holy days, the feast, and, and come and celebrate a feast to the Lord. God was separating them, and hopefully that they would come to their senses first, but they, they didn't come to their senses. There was a remnant, yes, but the bulk would not acknowledge him. Again, the reason was due to their sin. The cause of their exile banishment from God's land was a promise. God had promised him that he'd be obedient, and he would provide for him the land, and he would handle everything. Then in verse 6, the people would not be able to escape judgment no matter how hard they tried. 
there's the point of no return. You can try whatever you do. Decisions made. It's too late. The moment a person closes their eyes in this world, it's too late. It, you, you cannot go to purgatory and be prayed out of purgatory. Now is the day of salvation, the Bible says. It's too late later on. We come to the point too late. The judgment had to come. And the judgment, they would be, again, set out of the land, but there was still hope that they would come to the census, as we saw, that they would come back and they would confess to God, not necessarily there at that time, but confess their sin. But most did not repent. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says this, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and righteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness, unrighteousness, because man, evil man, suppresses it. He says, what is wrong is right. He is good, he says. And then in Romans chapter 1, again, verse 29 through 32 Notice what it says, being filled with unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, Although they know, notice the ordinance of God, they know the law of God, but those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice it. Yeah, you're, that's good. Can you imagine what it's going to be like in that day of judgment? Wow. Now notice that list in, in, in I, I like to underline all those points when I'm doing my study. I like to understand what each thing means. And I like to pray through it, Lord, am, am I greedy? Am, am I evil? Am I full of envy? It's not just to be read over or glossed over. Because we could have those seeds in our heart. And unchecked, it, it will be consequences. Now, you can make a note, Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, gives us the deeds of flesh. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The warning is there from cover to cover. Will you choose life or will you choose death? The choice is yours. Revelation 21, in the very end of Revelation, again, it's talk, talking about, again, those who will not, they're, they're cowardly, afraid to confess Christ, unbelieving, unwilling to trust in the, the sinner as, as a savior. And they've seen all the judgments, everything, just as the Bible says, and they, they won't believe. Right to the end. But yet, even with that, you know that. Can we harden our own hearts? Can we justify sin in our own hearts? Can we allow some part of sin over here in this part of my heart and, and over here another part of heart and think that, that I'm better than someone else? Sin is sin. And God wants us to deal with the sin in our life. He wants us to put off the things in the flesh and put on the spirit. The seventh punishment is in verse 7. The days of the punishment have come. The days of retribution have come. Let Israel know this. The prophet is the prophet is a fool. The inspired man is demented because of the grossness of your iniquity and because of the hostility is so great. Ephraim was a watchman with God, a prophet. Yet the snare of the bird catcher is all of his ways and, and there is only hostility in the house of God. They've gone deep into depravity, as in all the days of Gibeah. And he'll remember the, the, their iniquity, and he will punish their sin. So he gives really two reasons here. First, the people were guilty of persecuting the prophets, and that's in verses 7 and 8 we saw. And secondly, the, the people were corrupt like the men of Gibeah. 
in the days of judges. The, the men had committed horrific crimes, assaulting and raping and murdering the concubine of the a Levite who was their guest. Though the Lord warns us all, he will exercise true justice. He knows all, he sees all, he's patient, he's long-suffering. But in the end, true retribution will come. A just payment for sin will be dealt with. Now look with me, chapter, or chapter 9, verse 10, right through the end of this chapter. It says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit on the fig tree in the first of the season. They came to Baal Peor, devoted themselves to shame, and they became detestable as, as, as that which they loved. As Ephraim, their glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Though they bring up their children, yet they will bereave them until men, till not a man is left. Yes, woe to them indeed when I depart from them. Ephraim, as I have seen, is planted a pleasant meadow like Tyre. But Ephraim will bring out his children for slaughter. And give them, O oh Lord, what, what will you give? Give them miscarriage, womb, and dry breasts. All their evil is, is at Gilgal, and indeed, I, I came to hate them there because the wickedness of their deeds. And I will, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. Their princes are rebels, and Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They will bear no fruit. Even though they bear children, I will slay the precious ones of their womb. In verse 17, my God will cast them away because they have not listened to him. They are wonders among the nations. And that's where Israel has been cast among the nations. The glory of Israel is referring here to the, the people would vanish. Just as Ichabod, the glory departed. But it fly away like a bird, verses 11 through 14. Figurative language used. Verse 15, you see the people would bear a hatred of God because of their dreadful wickedness. Again in verse 15, the people would be driven out of God's land or house. And as we mentioned already, again it repeats it because of their shameful sin. So those who confess their sin and repent of it, they can find favor. But those who refuse to will be judged. There are churches today that they're not churches of God. They're not God honoring. The people would no longer be loved by God primarily because the leaders were rebellious. A leader is one that should love God and love the people. I want to follow God. The people would no longer, again, be loved by God. The people would be stricken, made barren, did not bear children. Their, their children that would be born would be slain, slain in offspring. The people would be rejected by God and cast out simply because of their disobedience. In a sense, they'd be made homeless, Wondering the nations around the world are scattered in every nation around. God's been bringing a remnant out in every generation. There are believers, true completed Jews in these nations coming to acknowledge God, but there are few. And there's few in what's the professing church today. If we turn away from the Lord as Israel did, the Lord will turn away from us. He will cast us away. I'd like to finish with this verse. 2 Timothy 2.13 says this, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. 
It's a popular verse. A lot of people like to quote, well, I, I, yeah, faithless, but God's going to remain faithful, keep me. No, that's not what that's saying. If we're faithless, we, we don't have faith in him. Notice what it says. He remains faithful, faithful to his character. He cannot deny his character. He's a holy God. He must judge sin. He must judge rebellion. He must be true to his word. What about you? Will you serve the Lord today? Or will you serve yourself? There's only one or two choices. One, to choose him. The second is to choose yourself.